Fireside Chat, Episode 14, Lucas vs. Glenn Healy. Recorded April 24th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. And we're back for another Fireside Chat. Matt, Lucas, how are you guys doing? Excellent as always. We're recording the show on the 24th of April, and it's weird to think that there's still regular season hockey being played. Yeah, because right now it's the middle of exams, and my uh, some of my fondest memories of university involve cleaning out dorm rooms watching the first round. You had your own black garbage bag day. Yes, but because, uh, whatchamacallit, because the audio cut out uh, on my end a couple weeks ago, that is a reference to a previous joke that was really funny, and uh, now no one's going to get Although, of course, everyone's aware of you know, Green Garbage Bag Day and all that sort of stuff. But there was a joke involving Steve Bajan's Black Garbage Bag that was hilarious, and you're all unlucky for having missed it. So the biggest, uh, I'd say, controversy this past week has been people say, why does this team keep winning games? They need to be losing. Why are they winning? And I've been saying to people over the last little bit, when this team needed to win, they lost. When they need to lose, they win. Maybe the rebuild strategy should be nothing more than saying, hey, you guys got to go out and lose. And maybe they'll go win. Um, I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on if they should be winning or losing. I mean, yeah, we're, we may not get a great draft pick, but I think there's something to be said for having these young guys come up to the team and have that winning attitude. The Flames said they were going to have that, and they're following through with it. And I think these young guys we're bringing up are getting better experience by coming to the NHL and winning games. Well, that's the thing. The Flames prospects like Broby, Backlund, Berti, all of them are actually taking advantage of the opportunity and I don't see how anyone can complain when you know like if you saw Brody's goal last night like that was spectacular and like how can you complain about that <laughs> you know yeah we might get a slightly worse draft pick but this draft is actually pretty good on the top end so even if we're picking eighth we're still getting a guy that should go should have went in the top three if it was another year. So it the guy will still be the best prospect we have. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I think anyone in the top ten will be worth having. And other th- something else to keep in mind. Uh, there's only so much that the team could reasonably be expected to do in pursuit of failure. I mean, they, they played several teams that had a lot more to play for than they did, and they beat all of them. So that's more on the Wild and the Red Wings and, oh, God, the other team they beat is escaping me. Ducks. The Ducks. Okay, yes. The, well, that one I'm actually happy they won because that was uh, that was quite a beautiful moment, a team effort. The Oilers. A, uh, well, I, I don't even, yeah. They should have, the Oilers should have beat them. They had something to play for. But the Ducks game, I won't fault them for winning because that's, a, you know, win one for Kip for his last home start and send – one player off the way he deserves, sort of, finally. You know, I thought, it, like you said, it has more to do with the other team than us. And if you look at the roster the Flames put out, I mean, they're icing, you know, almost half a roster of farm players. They had Joey McDonald in for most of those games. They were playing the backup. They were doing everything they possibly could to give themselves a handicap. Well, that's the thing. They, they didn't realize that uh, by removing veteran players that they'd actually increase their chance of winning. So, you know, a little bit of fault on Hartley for that. I mean, the only thing they could do better if they wanted to lose is pull the goalie and play six skaters all game. Uh, that's probably fine-worthy. But why, why, doesn't, uh, why does this team, do you think, play better without the veterans? How would you say? Uh, I think it's mostly complacency. You know, because like, they've not, never had to actually fight for jobs because there hasn't been anyone nipping at their heels. And like even like when Berchi earlier in the season was having a little bit of struggles, like he wasn't getting an opportunity to actually change and, you know, make an opportunity of it. 
Instead, he was stuck with Bejan and McGratton and that. I think the big change came after Jerome and Bo Meester left, and we've seen kind of incremental change from there as different veterans have been removed from the lineup as well. But for years, and we were talking a little bit about this before the show, for years people said this team was uncoachable. I mean, Mike Keenan said that, who was a former coach here, and everyone said it was the veterans, and they'd move most of the veterans, but those two pieces that were really left were Jerome and Jay, and now they're gone. So I think we're starting to see a good coach who can now do what he's paid to do, which is coach these guys and make them better. Yes, because young players, shockingly, listen. Because they know they could be sent back down to the farm at a moment's notice, even when the organization is supposedly high on them, a la Berchi, if you don't, you know, shape up. And listen to what the coach tells you, because the coach, guess what? He knows more than you. I think it also has something to do with the room, too. I mean, I... I'm not in the room, I don't know, but I have a feeling that with those guys gone and with some of the players that are now not playing in the games, there's been new locker room leaders that have emerged. There's been a new, probably, culture that's coming in the locker room that I think might be helping out as well. I'm sure it's more fun to come to work, and I'm sure when uh, the people who are in charge of supposedly leading the team aren't resigned to the fact they'll be dealt at the deadline or just emotionally dead inside... Like uh, Mr. J hasn't played in the playoffs in nearly 700 games. Bo Meester, I don't know if you saw his uh, quote after they asked him about what's it like to finally break that playoff bubble. And he just said something like, oh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to play the games. He's like, go to hell. <laughs> like, this is, the, this is the reason you've never done anything with your life. Well, okay, you've, you've cashed huge checks, so you've done something with your life, but there's a reason nobody in your profession friggin' respects you. Because you're good at hockey, but you don't love it, and that's... And, and ugh. Ugh. I... Well, you know, I, I just think of myself. I mean, I don't make anywhere near what these guys make, and I don't, uh, you know, play a professional sport, but when I enjoy going to work... I do a better job at my at my work. I think we can all agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you've really derailed me from my anti J Bowmeister tirade. I know. I think I, I tried. I tried to pull you off that. Why? He deserves it. Well, one thing that uh, you can mark up as kind of pathetic: Hanowski and Kandari their point per game percentage is actually higher than a Ginla and Bomeisters combined. Ha! As Flames or as members of their new team? As members of their new team. Oh, okay. Well, let, let's... That, that This is as good a time as any to talk about Mark Kandari because I have a new candidate to, uh... as to, you know, whose jersey I'm going to get next year. Uh, because Mark Kandari impresses the hell out of me. He is a just an absolutely uh how do i say this um a complete missing piece uh as to what sort of attitude this team has lacked yes like that that brody goal you brought up yesterday or, or earlier from last night against nashville like he Kendari is forechecking below the blue line finishes a check or below the red line finishes a check uh cycles the puck around and he's i believe he's on his wrong he's on the wrong side like he's completely on the other side of the ice and he's gonna need to um rein in his pinches a bit or he's gonna get really exposed once coaches realize that that's what he does but that that sort of element that aggressiveness that ability to drive the play uh it's not been here for a long time yeah and he did have some struggles in the game yesterday but you know it's his second game so that's not really surprising like I recall TJ Brody being terrible in his first few games up here so even you know even guys that have been playing in the NHL for 10-20 years have bad games once in a while yeah but everything that he brings is has been sorely needed and missed for... And he's better than a point per game so far. He's uh, two games played, one goal, two assists, and two penalty minutes. And he's uh, pl- his plus minus is zero. So, you know, he's on the right foot so far. Yeah, just, uh, you know, 
brings that that physical aggressive element to the defense that's been to the team really that's been lacking. I think I said in our post trade deadline show I like Kandari every time I've seen him uh, when he was with Windsor and the few times I've seen him when he played in Peoria in the AHL. I liked what he had, and I was glad to see that that's what we got back for Jay. I think it's a good piece. I, yeah, j- just, you know, looking at how much he appears to care, uh, positive positive acquisition going forward. So maybe we were too harsh on, that, on, on Jay for that. But again, it's only been two games, and we're wrong a lot. Everyone's wrong a lot. We're not even insiders. We don't have Drager's fancy Blackberry or his connections. What do we know? And yeah, we're wrong. I, I'd say as much as anybody else is. We just admit to it a lot more. You know, one thing I do find funny is when Luke uh, complains about a certain player like Como earlier or Beijing, the next night they score the game-winning goal. <laughs> Yeah. What we might have to do is between shows, we might have to have a, a night where Lucas just comes on and rants about everybody on the team. Uh, that, then I, they'll I, all I score might be goals. the slump buster for this team. Like, remember a couple of years ago when Kelly Rudy slammed Ray, uh, Ray Bork, Rene Bork on Hockey Night in Canada, and then Rene Bork played yeah. with passion and fire for two games? Are you trying to say you're the new Kelly Rudy? I think I am. And I don't think that's an unreasonable assertion. I've played the game at a lower level. And, you know, Rudy's doing a good job in the in the booth. Uh, so you, you need another in-studio uh, personality, a combative goalie, as it were. So, uh, heels, take a walk. I got this. Them's fighting words. I'll fight Glenn Healy. I'll moose him right in the eye. All right, well, the challenge has been laid down. We'll see if Healy, uh, if Glenn gets a hold of us and wants to come up with a date and time for you guys to to go at it. I'm putting 20 bucks on Healy. <laughs> He's got that little man range. If, if and when this fight happens, we'll take bets on the website. Yes, and, uh, and, and I don't know, we'll get Bodog to sponsor us or something. Lucas, can I sell the pay-per-view through the website as well? If you can, I I think if I'm fighting Glenn Healy, uh, someone's gonna pay more money for it than you can offer. But I'll I'll you I'll so? give you a link to a to a pirated stream. Actually, no, I won't. That's taking money out of my pocket. Whoever wants to pay for this fight, I'll you know, we'll, we'll, I'll I'll be there. Your move, Healed. All right, the the challenge is down. Everyone thinks you're irritating, Glenn. Any other young players you guys have uh, noticed or wanted to chat about? This Sven week? has a There's six a whole game bunch point of them in the line. Yeah. There you go. Well, one thing that I've been encouraged by, like the Flames yesterday were rather uncoordinated at times with all the young players, but I am rather encouraged by guys like Horak and Reinhardt, uh, especially because they're actually showing some confidence in their own abilities and like even when one play where Reinhardt was having a bad shift and rushing he came back after the intermission and actually played good again and you know like they're learning how to be NHL players and that's encouraging for sure Roman Horak has looked awesome since he's come back uh just you know, just a very useful player going forward. Especially, yeah, mind uh, you, um, I wouldn't have either of those guys above the fourth line. Like, you know, because we should have players that are better than that offensively ahead of them. But, you know, you, we need anchor players for the fourth line, and I think those two can definitely fill that. Mm-hmm. I, well, I mean, I think Roman Horak's probably, you know, at least a third liner when he maxes out. Possibly if he ever develops some offensive consistency, he's a second liner, but, you know, he's, he's, his positional play is excellent. He's, he's a great skater. He's got a good shot. And he's only 21. He's still got time I, to develop. I think, yeah, I often forget just how young Roman Horak is. Uh, yeah. 
Would you trade? Would I think you... Horak and Barchi were served well by being sent back to Abbotsford. I know I questioned that earlier in the season when Feaster sent them back down, and I thought, why is he doing this? We need them up here. But I really think it was good for their confidence. Yeah, and and just to get them to be better professional NHL level hockey players. And uh, we we owe I think uh, Troy Ward a bit of a, an apology. We were a little bit critical of him earlier in the earlier in the season, but I mean, once again, we were wrong. Yep. The other young guy that I've been watching uh, during these games, and curious to see what you guys are thinking, is um, Ben Hanowski. And I mean, we talked about him last week. He comes in with a lot of pressure on him already. He's played four games. He's got one point. He needs a plus one. I'm, I like him. I don't see him as being, I think some people automatically think he should be like a top, you know, two-line guy. I don't think he's there, but I think he definitely deserves a, at least a good look for an NHL spot next year. Bottom six. I, I think he's, uh, at least until Christmas, needs to be in the NHL. He's He's yeah. not. He's not ready for the NHL yet. No. It, how would you say he has the ability to get into the right positions offensively? And there was many opportunities for him if the puck had just actually got to him in front of the net. So it's just that he still needs to work on all the secondary aspects of the game, which I do believe being in the AHL would help move that along a little quicker. I'm really impressed by how well he's been able to ramp up from the NCAA level to the NHL level very quickly. Yeah, he he definitely, you know, he doesn't look like he's, I don't know, um, what doesn't he look like? He doesn't look like he's uh, not capable of keeping up or behind the play mentally or anything like that, but he isn't at the point where he's going to be ahead of anything yet. I wish he wouldn't have cut his hair. I thought he had a really cool look when he had the long hair. I Yeah, I agree. I, I think that that should be something the entire team does next year. Like, go, yeah, go just, like, full 70s. Yeah. Show, show up to the games wearing brown leather jackets, aviators, crazy mustaches. Look like the cast of Almost Famous, basically. Broad Street Bullies? We need Yager hair from the 90s. Awesome. Have everybody just, the whole team? Yeah, everybody. I I'm just picturing right now Feaster and Hartley with mullets. Awesome. <laughs> not not the coaches. The coaches need to maintain an air of like, I don't know, suits. You don't want to see Hartley behind the bench in aviators and a leather jacket. Actually, I would love that. I just don't think he needs to grow his hair out. He's got the Hans Landa look working well for him. True. What have you guys thought of Ben Street so far? Eh, irrelevant. What Matt said. Yeah, I've I've looked at him. I didn't think he really deserves a spot next year. Um, I think it was worth a shot. They probably had to go, you know, take a look, see what they've got, and probably make up their mind. What I was really surprised though is that Leland Irving got recalled over um, Danny Taylor. Danny Taylor's hurt. That's apparently the only reason. Oh, is it? Yeah. I didn't know that he was injured. He's got... Uh, 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 he is another person with a grade something or other MCL sprain. I've never heard of this injury before this year, yet all of a sudden everyone in the NHL's got one. An MCL no, sprain? No, a grade 2 MCL sprain. They're, it's very specific in, in, in the world of... Where, where Alain Vigneault just said uh, Corey Schneider has a body injury. What other type of injury could he have? Mental... He's depressed. Gingivitis. <laughs> I'd love to see somebody who actually uh, took some time off because they had gingivitis. That that yeah, that's more of a soccer injury. I'd love to see a team try to fill out the paperwork for a seven uh, for a stint on the seven day IR because of gingivitis. The uh, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are famous for violating the rules of uh, the the league in which they operate. Uh, and one year, I, be- I remember Danny Barrett uh, placing some guy on on the injured reserve list or whatever, and they asked, "What's his injury?" And he went, "Mosquito bite." 
and <laughs> that's great. And it's like that's why everyone hates you. You know that, right? If if a football player can go on the IR for mosquito bite, I'm going to try and file a workman's comp claim for mosquito bite this summer. Uh, they'll love you. <laughs> Keep in mind, the Rough Riders are uh, constantly being sanctioned by the league for violating, uh, you know, the rules. And it's still probably the most interesting thing that happens in Saskatchewan. Yeah. I hate Saskatchewan. Like, I understand why people in Vancouver act like tools. Because if I lived in a place that, from all the pictures I've ever seen, and when I've been there, is frankly a jewel of Western civilization, it's just you know, location, architecture, the whole kit and caboodle. Great. I understand why you're superior jackals. What's Saskatchewan got to offer? All those tourist attractions, cultural epicenters. No. You're famous for a football stadium that looks like a bloody field of wheat from an airplane. How about some monochromatic themes? All right, what were you you going to talk about? I just want to make sure you feel better now. No, I don't, but I'll I'll think of something else to draw my ire. I was going to say, last week we had a really good discussion about uh, restricted free agents and who we would bring back to this team. And I've been doing the research, I know you guys have been too, about free agents and who we would bring back or perhaps bring in new to this team next year um, as far as the unrestricted free agents go. So why don't I give you guys the list just that everyone uh, can play along at home of who the Flames have that is a UFA at the end of this season. Uh, we've got Roman Trevanka, Anton Babchuk, Leland Irving, Brian McGratton, Brett Carson, Ben Walter, Mike Teswide, Chris Kalanos, Danny Taylor, and Steve Bajan. Are any of those guys guys that you'd bring back? Matt, why don't you get started? Uh, I would go with McGratton and maybe Steve Bajan. The rest can pretty much go. Lucas, who'd you bring back from that list? Uh, I would say McGratton, and that's about it. I've got no need for anyone else on that uh, on that list. I know what they can do, and what they can't do is get into the playoffs. So... Yeah, the reason why I wouldn't bring Trevenka back is that if, if you're going to waste a roster spot, at least get somebody that can actually play without being a complete liability. Yeah, I, I agree. Trevenka is one of those guys, like, he is, you know, he's scoring at whatever, a 40-point pace this year or something like that, but he doesn't really fit in the top six. Uh, he's certainly not a bottom six player, so he's one of those tweeners that needs to go back to Europe and make his money. And you know, I don't begrudge him anything. I, I it was a good experiment, but you know. Yeah, I think it was a worthwhile thing for the Flames to do: bring him in, try it out, and good for them for only signing him for a year. So they're not bound by that deal forever. Well, they were only able to sign him for one year anyway, just because of his age, I believe. Yeah, the thing is, is that. Um... The Flames also need to be cognizant of the fact that they only have about seven top nine positions available, or like they're already called for. So, you know, they have to make sure that they're not putting so so players in where, you know, you could have someone like Horak or Reinhardt or our first round uh, pick take a spot instead. So, you know, like, you get into a little bit of roster crunch needlessly. Yeah, yeah the the Flames have 17 forward contracts for next year, which includes um, some guys that are on entry levels that will be staying at the farm, but there's 17 forward contracts already. From that list, I think myself, I would agree, let's bring McGratton back. He's making 600000 this year. I'd sign him for the same. He's only 31. For some reason, I keep thinking McGratton's older than he is, but... I'd bring Bejan back at the same price, uh, 525 or even 550 If we can do a two-way deal on it, though, I liked this year that there was that safety net there, that if we needed to send him down for any reason, we had that net. Not that I'm worried about him being claimed on waivers, but I think from this list, too, if I were the Flames, knowing that you can have 50 contracts and not all 50 are going to be NHL guys, 
I'd probably take at least one more year with Danny Taylor because I think he's a solid backstop for the AHL team. Well, yeah. Uh, the only thing is is that we have uh, Barra coming over, Ramos likely coming over, and uh, Brossois is needing to go in the AHL as well. So You can always loan him out too, though. Yeah, that's not good, though. For developmental purposes. Yeah, I, th- I think you owe it to Danny Taylor to just let him go find his fortune elsewhere. Let him go? Because, like, there, there's just no space for him. To say nothing of what Orteo's going to do. Yeah, well, that's it. I think Orteo's kind of the the key element there, because I don't think that uh, Ramo will go to the HL when he comes over. No. So I think it's going to depend on uh, Ordeo and where they want to slot him in. But I think right now, if I'm looking at who they're probably going to bring back, I think that uh, Barra becomes the AHL starter. I could yeah. see that for sure. Ease Brassois in. Yeah, unless he comes in and just like has three shutouts in training camp or something. I think Ben Walter's not done anything to prove himself. Chris Kalanos was a failed experiment. Um, Anton Babchuk, they better not re-sign him. Brett Carson's 27. I don't see value here. I think we could fill that spot with somebody else. Leland Irving, uh, his time in Calgary, I think we could all agree, is done. Yep, without question. And the only other guy is Mike Teswide, who the Flames brought over in a trade this year. And I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen him a lot play in the AHL since he came. I don't know, I actually haven't seen him at all since he's come here play, but... By all accounts, he's nothing memorable. No, and considering we traded a guy, we traded a guy who isn't wasn't really in our plans anyway. I believe he was in the ECHL at the time of his trade, Mitch Wall. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they don't they're not yeah. married to him by any stretch. And no, and Tessweet is twenty six, and kind of my general rule of thumb's always been that if you're over 24 and you're not on the radar for you know one of the top three guys in the depth chart on the farm you're probably not going to make it my rule of thumb has always been that if you're over 24 and not one of the top three guys who looks like they're going to make the big club i'm allowed to beat you with a switch that's only as big as my thumb you're violent tonight (laughs) i am First Glenn Healy, now our prospect? I'm not saying I, I, I want to. I'm just saying that it should be on the table if he steps out of line. <laughs> it's a good thing we do this show remotely because we may have a restraining order for, for, against you in the cell dome for X number of feet. So you might have to do the show from Edmonton or oh, something next week. Oh, come on. My test weed is not ever going to be setting foot in the saddle dome. If I if if we had the you know if maybe I'd get a restraining order for the Abbotsford Sports and Entertainment Center or wherever wherever it is they play, but uh, no, he's not. I'm not gonna be in danger at the Saddle Dome from Mike Testweed. I wouldn't even know what he looks like. Neither would anyone who's not his mom. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he's wearing his number on his back. That's the only way you can identify him. Even right? then, he'd better be wearing a name bar because if it's just a number, I'm gonna be hooped. So the Flames have about 12 NHL contracts on the Ford side next year, it looks like. Or, including Blair Jones, who's kind of a swing. So let's say 11 or 12. Who else would you guys bring in to fill out that uh, that Ford oh, roster? Can, can, I, can I make a quick uh, addendum to this game? Sure. Uh, l- let's, let's say that we can add uh, at most uh, three play- uh, two players in free agency. Two unrestricted free agents. All right. All right, go now. Go. Okay, well, for me, it would be Eric Nystrom and one of Bobby Sanguinetti, Chris Summers, or Matt Carrenti. With all three of those guys are defensemen. Well, let's do forwards first. Sanguinetti's a defenseman. Yeah, all those three, the last three, were defensemen. Eric Nystrom, we talked about last week. I think he'd be worth bringing back. Ah, I mean, I've got no problem with uh, Eric Nystrom. Uh, A guy I would seriously look long and hard at bringing in is uh, uh, Mr. Max Lapierre of the uh, of the Vancouver Canucks currently. Uh, As far no divers. I know he's a diver and he's an he's an asshole, but again, it's that hatred, something that you know, just drives other 
players bonkers when they play us and just makes them hate us that much more. I and I you know, yeah, okay, the the diving is How much is Lapierre making? One million dollars and he's twenty eight years he's, old and he's a center. And he's- 28. So, well, you okay. know, I could stomach Pod Bertuzzi being on the Flames, but, you know, I have limits, and Lapierre is over that line. Well, Todd Bertuzzi tried to kill somebody. Max Lapierre is just a dick. <laughs> and, and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing illegal about being a dick. Breaking people's necks, you know, different argument, I would argue. Um... And I, I don't know. I, I just think there's nobody on this team that you'd hate to play against. Aside from perhaps Kandari in the future, it looks like he's going to be a real uh, thorn in people's sides. But uh, that lack of uh, hateable element on our team uh, concerns me going forward. Matt's given his thumbs down to Lapierre, and I think I'm going to give mine too. All right. That's, that's, I mean, I, I don't expect a lot of people to be on board with signing Lapierre, but... I'm always in favor of signing super pests that can play and just irritate the hell out of the opposition. I think they're incredibly useful, and I don't give a damn how much Ray Ferraro doesn't like the way they play the game. I didn't well, like the way Ray Ferraro the, played the game. Well, the thing is, is that like I don't mind that that type of player. Like my favorite player was Flurry, so you know like, I'm not adverse to those types. It's just him in particular. I understand. Him and Burrow, him and Burrows are the two players that I hate the most in the league, and would be extremely pissed if we ever got them. So, you know, and not not for anything they do, like you know, talent wise, it's just yeah, no. <laughs> it's the diving and the fact that they can both grow the stupidest mustaches. Exactly. Like, they'd look like someone... You hate them for their facial hair? I do hair? hate them for their facial hair, because they both grow facial hair that looks like they're, you know, the kind of guy that if you were on vacation in Paris, they'd try to sleep with your girlfriend. That's the sort of <laughs> facial hair they have. Whereas, you know, we want the almost famous 70s rock star look next year. Uh, oh, Burroughs and Lapierre. You know, it's a good thing Lucas isn't a GM. I'd love to see you answer your owners and say, so why did you overpay this guy? Because he's got good facial hair. He looks like he's from the 70s. <laughs> I, didn't say, I wouldn't overpay him for that. I just think we should all do it. You'd be out of a job in the NHL as fast as Pierre Maguire was. I don't think I would be. Because I think my owner would be like, you know what? This is, a, this is something that's going to put asses in seats. I don't know. I, 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 again, I'm not, I'm not signing players based on their abilities to grow facial hair. I'm just saying that if everyone... You know, we can get wigs. Pros, no, prosthetics. Maybe not prosthetics, because if you if you took like a hard hit and your mustache came off, how humiliating would that be? <laughs> that would that would be pretty funny. You'd be though. on top tens for the next fifty years. They'd never forget that. I'd love to. I'd love to see a guy who gets high sticked in the face and his mustache is on the end of some other guy's stick. Oh, that'd be hilarious. And then the next, and then the next game, he comes out wearing those uh, those glasses with the fake nose and the mustache on them. <laughs> proving that he's got a sense of humor about things, and thus he wins, even though he did get caught wearing a fake mustache. You can tell it's a slow time for Flames news, can't you? <laughs> uh. So we've got uh, two of us that said um, Eric Nystrom. I'd like to bring him back here. I'll bring back Eric Nystrom, too. Why not? So there's three of us. He's 30, and he's making 1.4, and I think we could pay him about the same, and I'd still bring him in. Yeah, I'd even go up to two, just, you know. To make we, sure we've got the room, yeah, exactly. why not? And why not? Anyone else you want to throw up besides Lapierre, in, Lucas? In the forward ranks, not really, no. Uh, if we're going to go and add a top six guy, I'd try to get Clarkson off of New Jersey. Yeah, okay. He's sort of like a slower Glen Cross that can score. If, uh, if I had to add a top six player i would probably say the guy they should go hardest after is bozak but i feel like if you overpay him too much that could be a you know that could be a bit of an albatross going mm-hmm. forward but it, it would solidify the center position for sure let me throw out some guys that are perhaps not on anybody's radar and see what you guys think two guys that i might bring in one if we want a, a younger guy i mean he's not really young but he's under 30 would be boyd gordon as a third-line centerman. 
Yeah, that's possible. 29, you just make him 1.3 this year? Yeah, that kind of fits in the Nystrom mold. Yeah, I can see. I think he's a player that you could put into sort of a gritty role as well. Yeah. But as yeah, we've I have no about, objections. Well, as we, I think as we've talked about the bottom six, uh, you know, it is, I think, fully capable of being stocked mostly by guys in our own organization right now. So I, I don't know much, if anything, about Boyd Gordon, so... I can't really comment on him, but I don't know. I'm sure he wouldn't hurt things. I just, I would like to see that sort of role filled from within if possible. I put this question out to some people on various forums I go to, and somebody on one of the forums said that they would bring in Jamie Langenbrunner. As much as it's interesting, I don't think we need to bring in another 37-year-old veteran to this team. No. I'd bring Langenbrunner in in absence of, or in lieu of Steve Bejan. I think they'd bring he'd bring more to the table. True. Yeah, I guess that's true. I'd even bring him in if they could move another veteran. Like if Tange moves to the draft or something like that, I think Langenbrunner could fill that role. I, I think you bring that Langenbrunner and Tange don't fill the same sort of, I guess... They fill the same kind of veteran leadership role. I think um, Langenbrunner is a better leader than... Tange. Yeah, but Tange is a top six scoring forward. I mean, if you want to bring in Langevuda for leadership, go for it. But, I mean, Tange ultimately still has, I guess, a... Uh, he, he still has... An, the, the, the team still needs him. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I don't I don't think Langenbrunner's going to put up Tange numbers. No. No. And the last forward I'll throw out, and then we can move to the... The blue line would be uh, Ryan Jones from Edmonton. Why not? I'd be interested if, uh, you know, why not? Like, again, I, I mentioned it last week. He seems to always be looking like he's trying. Uh, mm-hmm. Somehow he's a top six player at Edmonton, it looks like. He's 28 and he's making a million and a half. If you could get him for about the same price as Nystrom, I'd bring him in. But not Matt's inflated $2 million man crush Nystrom, like 1.6. One, I think one three to one six and a half. I'd bring in Jones. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that, and it makes the Oilers worse. There you go. That's always a plus. So I think we've settled on our three forwards then, according to the rules that you want to put on this game, Lucas. We got Eric Nyström, Boyd Gordon, and Ryan I Jones. I only said two. Ah. Oh, okay. Well, we got an extra yeah. then. Well, th- three, we three extra. free agents in general. I think because I don't think you want to overpopulate the team with. Guns yeah. for hire. No, we're, we're we're losing six forwards, and some of those guys are farm guys. So, mm-hmm. so moving to the back end, the only two that we're losing are Anton Babchuk and Brett Carson. Any defensemen you'd want to bring in? I'd also like to lose Chris Butler, but I've made that perfectly clear. So if yeah, there, same if, here. <laughs> if there is a god. Yeah, that's why I like it. I would actually try and sign one of Sanguinetti, Summers, or uh, Carenti because they're all 25, and, you know, at worst, they're at worst I like they're Sanguinetti. Butler 2.0. Actually, you know what? I've just realized, since I'm so often wrong on this podcast, and, you know, people tend to score game-winning goals and whatnot after I lambaste them, um, Chris Butler is a vital cog of this team, a core piece going forward. I see a 60-point defenseman, a Norris nomination, and perhaps <laughs> the next Scott Niedermeyer in young number 44, and I think if Jay Feaster has any sense whatsoever, he's going to lock him up to a seven-year, $28 million contract yesterday and get this franchise back on track. Lucas, you know what's going to happen now, That's right? That's going to happen. <laughs> Some pro scout who wants to make his case is going to give Jay just that snippet of our show. Uh, you know what? If that happens, I hope that uh, Jay Feaster then turns around, plays that to someone else who's not very smart, and trades Chris Butler for a first-round pick and a third. There you go. That's the leverage you give some other GM. Hey, listen to these hacks on the internet. They love this guy. You should take them off my I hands. I am not a hack. I'm better than Glenn Healy in both hockey analysis and fisticuffs. We well, haven't proven that yet. Well, and until until Glenn answers the bell, I, I will take that as my own personal victory. 
<laughs> we don't know that I'm not. That's true. Yeah. Matt, I'd take Sanguinetti. I like Sanguinetti. Yeah, like... We're... We, uh... With the Defense Corps, we also don't have too many spots. Because I think Kundari should get the opportunity to be a third pairing guy next year. And, you know, if you have Sarich there, then you only have one roster spot left. So, you know... Getting someone like one of those guys, you could possibly give them the opportunity to try and develop. And with defensemen, sometimes they're late bloomers. Like, say like Brian Rafalski, he didn't actually develop until he was like 26 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the Flames only have four defensemen of NHL caliber locked up for next year because Butler's an RFA, so I have a feeling the team just won't qualify him and and he'll move on. You know what, I, I could see them, as much as I just said sign him for a $28 million extension, I could see them giving him some sort of smaller extension. They wanted to give Como two years, so. Well, that's what I said last week. I said, you know, when we were talking about this, I said, I can see them bringing him back. And to me, I've always thought, you know, if you've got a piece like him who's not an integral cog, but they play a certain role... Sometimes it's almost better to to stay with the devil you know than the devil you don't, and I'd maybe bring him back and you know make him work his way back up, give him the seventh defense spot, and make him work for a roster spot. I would always rather go with the devil I don't know. At least the devil I don't know could surprise me. Yeah, but we've still got room to bring in those guys we don't I know. I suppose. I mean, personally, my uh, my only addition from the free agent pool, as it stands right now, because it's god awful. Uh, I would go out, I would give Sergei Gonchar four and a half to five million dollars on a one-year deal. Really? I would. I I think, you know, that veteran presence on the back end, good puck mover, Still, he still can move around a bit. Uh, and then at the end of the year, you move him for, I don't know, some sort of return like Yager got if you're not in the playoff position. Or, you, or he helps you get to the playoffs. Um, you don't think Gonchar is going to want a no-trade clause? Well, he might, but don't give it to him. I mean, it, it, it has to, you know, I, I think you overpay for him a little bit on a one-year deal because you'll have the space, and then you can turn him into assets later on, and you're essentially buying draft picks down the road. It's not a bad idea. It gives him a marketable name, too. Yeah, and I mean, realistically, like, w- would you would you guys have signed Yarmer Yager this year for $4.5 if you'd known... We could just flip him at the deadline for what Boston gave for him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so like this is, I, I think, a pretty similar situation, and you know, playoff teams would be, I'm sure, lining up to get a guy like him come the trade deadline next year, and he'll probably help guys like Brody and Kandari, and help even Giordano maybe rediscover some of his game. It's not a, not a bad idea. I like that. And, yeah, you're going to pay a little bit more for him, but I think it's worth uh, paying the money. Mm-hmm. You're not gonna You're not going to give it all to him anyway, so... True. And we have the cap room to play with, which does make things interesting as well. Yeah, well, like, if Kipper doesn't come back, then, like, we're going to actually have a hard time hitting the floor. Not if we give Sergei Gonchar five and a half million. And that's the point i was trying to reinforce there <laughs> i know i know i'm just, i don't know i'm being i'm being a dick tonight so i think we all agreed on uh, sanguinetti on the on the blue line i don't know anything about him if you guys like him and last but not least we've got to fill a hole in the net do we uh, i think we can probably all agree kipper's done possible i don't think he's, he's probably gonna back. i think he might weigh things in the off season, but it's like seventy thirty that he's done. Yeah, and I I don't think I think he is gone for sure, especially after the last uh, that game against Anaheim, which was really quite lovely. Uh, I think he's hanging him up at the end of the year. Uh, and on that note, I don't think there is a real hole that we can go fill in free agency. I mean, we're not going to go get Nick Backstrom. Uh, and we've well, I found it interesting that the Flames signed Joey McDonald for another year, and I think that's a telling sign as well. Yes. Yeah, I think what you'll see is Ramo and McDonald play. 
Uh, yeah. Unless Barra that decides was what I was to, thinking too. you know, come out of the woodworks and show some something. Yeah, I'll, uh, let, let, let's call this, I'm going to call my shot right now. I'm going to say Ramo plays, uh, let's say 50 games. Uh, McDonald plays uh, 22 and then Barra gets the rest. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I, I think that's right too. I wasn't going to go out and get a free agent looking at the free agent goalies. There's really nobody out there I'd want that's any better than what we've got. Um, so I'd say, yeah, Ramo is the starter. I think uh, McDonald will be the backup. And we'll see what Barra can do if he comes up at all and what they might have him do or not Let do. Let me amend my prediction very quickly. I'll say Ramo plays 50, uh, McDonald uh, 20, uh, Barra 12. There you go. If he if he's capable of it, he will. But I, I'm leery of calling him capable of it yet. It wouldn't surprise me, but and you know the nice thing with Joey McDonald on a one year is, I mean, if at camp we get two two new goalies that surprise the heck out of the team, it's easy to either buy that out or bury it. I mean, it's nine hundred thousand. You can still bury that and get most of it off the cap. You'd only be on the hook for a hundred thousand. I think you could trade it, Joey, or maybe. waivers, or yeah, wave him. Like, he, he, yeah, wave him. Everybody needs a backup goalie in case of injury, so... That's true. And people, uh, I, I know people in Detroit, I, I believe, still are pissed off that uh, Jonas Gustafsson is their backup instead of Joey McDonald. Oh, I would Everybody be wants too. a goalie with a funky nickname. Yeah. Do you know Jonas Gustafsson has a modified no-trade clause? Oh, so really? like that truck. Yeah. <laughs> NH- Did they inherit that from Toronto? No, they no. signed him. They gave it to him. Oh, later. really? Okay. So. Wow. I I never understand what I mean. Modified could mean I don't want I don't want to go to one team, right? I mean, he could he could have the no Edmonton clause in his contract. Who knows? He could, but I feel like anyone who you're signing up to be a backup and demands no trade clause, it's like, oh okay, really? oh you're demanding a no trade clause. Well, I'm gonna go sign this guy. And he's not going to demand a no-trade clause, and he's going to get an NHL paycheck. How's that taste, Jonas? So for the for the most part, I'm just looking at the numbers here. Uh, Flames have 28 contracts next year, so that's a far stretch from the 50 they can carry. And that includes farm guys like uh, Turner Elson, David Eddy, uh, John Ramage. So they've got a lot of contracts to fill, and I think the ones we talked about would be your big uh, pieces. But... Who knows what they're going to do? I mean, they still have to fill a whole AHL roster off that too. Mm-hmm. Definitely, we may see we may see a guy like Kalanos come back just to fill an AHL spot. As much as I hope not, if it's not him, it'll be somebody like him. I think. Are most AHL rosters made up of like half AHL contract guys and half NHL property guys? Most of them are like two thirds to almost full of NHL guys, oh. and the AHL only fills brings in their own guys to fill holes. Okay, I'd almost be more. I, I wonder if that's worth just having the flexibility to do that a little bit more. Just I don't know. Probably not. We've seen the Flames sign guys that were AHL property, like Danny Taylor was signed by the Abbotsford Heat, and that's how the Flames evaluated him, and then they signed him. Yeah, and, like, I would actually rather the Flames only have, like, say, like, 40 or 42 contracts and just let Utica or wherever they're playing next year... Abbotsford. Whatever. Have them, you know, sign guys like Danny Taylor just to fill spots and, you know, tell them if they actually do perform, then... Yeah, we'll sign them later. But even to even to get to forty five spots, that means we still got to bring in seventeen guys. So there's going to be a lot of turnover within the organization. Maybe not on the top roster, but within the organization, unless they re-sign a lot of their RFAs, there's going to be a lot of turnover. And that's good. It should be. I, I yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, like the thing is, is that by having extra roster spots, you can get guys off of waivers. And, you know, sign college free agents. It lets you make two-for-one deals and that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, the, the reason I brought up, uh, or I mentioned Abbotsford, is uh, the city of Abbotsford was not able to negotiate a uh, a proper release with the Flames to 
allow the Canucks farm team to move in, which I assume means uh, the Canucks weren't willing to pay what the Flames wanted for that real estate. So, yeah, so that that's uh, that's what's going on with that. Well, I'm surprised. I mean, Vancouver said they want their team closer. The Flames said they don't want their team there. I'm surprised they don't just almost swap uh, farm franchises and then let the Flames do whatever they want with the other one. Do, do they both have part ownership in an NHL team? I know the Flames have a big ownership stake in Abbotsford. No, they own yeah. the franchise, but I believe the city covers all their losses, which is a pretty sweetheart deal. The AHL's transient nature creeps me out. But yeah, I mean, I think any minor league is pretty transient in any sport. I mean, even when the Calgary Cannons were in town here, teams around them were always changing. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. You know, there's small markets. They're hard to bring people in. I, I really think that if the Hitmen weren't owned by the Flames, they probably wouldn't be in town anymore either. I uh, no idea. <laughs> I think, well, the, the Hitmen have got a, you know... 6,500 person base that is more than enough to sustain junior hockey. And junior hockey is... But look at what happened with the Roughnecks, though. The, they're in an expensive building. Yeah, and I'll, personally, I think the Hitmen should play in the Corral. Uh, just because 6,500 people in the... Nobody s- should be forced to play in the well, Corral. No, but here, here's my thinking. 6,500 people in the Saddle Dome makes it seem empty. 6,500 people in the Corral is way more intimidating. Or at least... In, uh, it's a more engaging fan experience, but in in, in a league, have you that's, watched talking the corral lately? I've never seen a game. It's in a pretty the dumpy building. Oh, I'm, I I know, and there's and there's a definite reason why they don't play there. But I don't think playing junior hockey in a twenty thousand seat venue is necessarily the greatest idea. I think it's about time we uh, wrap this up. Unless anyone else has anything they want to chat about. Not really. Healy, you know where to find me. Give him your Twitter handle so that he can find you. At Luke1701, L-U-C-1701. Matt, your your money's on, on Healy? Yeah, well, you know, Luke might have an advantage. He might swing his purse at him. How dare you, sir. <laughs> Good when job. Healy's not even in my weight class. So, so you'll have to bulk Anytime, up. Anytime, any place. Bring it on. All right, we got the challenge out of the way. If anyone wants to follow the progress of this challenge, see if Glenn actually responds to Lucas. Listen to any of our other episodes where we're not challenging uh, well-respected hockey broadcasters or read any of the great articles on the site. You can always follow us online at firesidechat.ca. Why don't you leave a comment in the show and let us know who you think would win that fight, Lucas or Glenn Healy. You can also do it through Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. Or you can come to Facebook and let us know what you think. Until next week, this is the Fireside Chat team signing off. For the record, six foot three, two hundred pounds. Suck it, Tom. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're looking for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat podcast produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.